about four to 500 years prior to, you know, the time of Jesus and even the, the triumphal entry that happened on Sunday in Isaiah, you know, he prophesied totally of the Messiah and how he would come. And in Isaiah 53, it tells us this in Isaiah 53. If you want to turn there, you're more than welcome to. It says in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We all like, we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It goes on, but that is a, a, what's called a messianic psalm. It's a psalm about Jesus, and, and we read that, and it just brings to us the account of what Jesus has endured for, um, for this day that we call Good Friday. Now, the question is, why do we call it Good Friday? Because it is a good day for us. It is a good day because we know the end of the story, right? We know what the book says and tells us, so we can rejoice fully in that. But at the time, at the time of the crucifixion, it was much, much different for a lot of people, even the apostles. And so let's go ahead and pray as we open up this evening's service and ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word tonight. We thank you for what you have done for us, Lord. There is absolutely nothing that we can do You tell us, Lord, in your word that our righteousness is even filthy rags, that 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 it's nothing, Lord. And yet, God, you have given us your righteousness, and that's why we are we can go to heaven, Lord, and, and, and God would see our righteousness upon us, your righteousness upon us, Lord, that we would be clothed in that that garment of righteousness. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for trading our sin for your righteousness, Lord. We thank you, God, for taking our sins, paying our debt, that penalty of death, you took it upon yourself. And so, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who was slain, as we read in Isaiah 53, for our transgressions, our bruising, Lord, it it bruised him for us. And so, Lord, tonight, we remember you, God. We remember what you did in sending your son Jesus to us that forever from that moment on, past, present, and future, our sins are forgiven. Amen. That there is no longer an issue with wondering if we're good enough or right enough. But Lord, we can come to you with all the broken pieces of our lives like shattered glass and you put them all back together. And so Lord, tonight we thank you for that. May Lord, we live our lives in a living testimony of thankfulness in sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we love you. May you bless this evening, God. May you give me, God, a clarity of speech and a clarity of mind as I just share from your word this evening, Lord, and the things you put upon my heart. For these people here tonight, Lord, my brothers and sisters here tonight, in Jesus' name, and all God's people say... 
Amen, amen. Okay, it's interesting with Good Friday, they also call it, in case you didn't know, Holy Friday, okay? So it's not only a Good Friday, but it's also a Holy Friday. And it's a day that we all believe and know that Jesus was crucified and he died, right? We know that to be the case. And so Christians all over the world are, in fact, um, uh, reminded and remembering what Jesus did on this very day over 2,000 years ago. We remember Jesus, I think, we can remember him in three broad ways. And I've got up on the screen for you. The first way is his life, uh, the encompassing of his birth all the way to his earthly ministry. The second thing that we know about the Lord is his death, his encompassing uh, the Gethsemane experience, that pressing experience in the garden, his betrayal, his sentencing even, his carrying the cross, his own cross, and even his crucifixion. We also remember him as the resurrection or in his resurrection, even his post-resurrection in the sense ministry to where he was on the earth for those 40 days. And many, many people, over 500 people were told to have seen, had seen him and were eyewitnesses to the Lord Jesus as he was in that post-resurrection ministry. Then, of course, his ascension into heaven, right? The angel says, hey, guys, why are you looking? Why are you looking up, man? He's going on. Now it's time to go and do what you have been equipped to do. Well, last Sunday, we began with Palm Sunday, right? Palm Sunday was that, that beginning of this Passion Week that we call it, from Palm Sunday all the way through Saturday evening, this week of Passion. And it continues, as I said, till the end of Saturday. There's Palm Sunday, there's Holy Monday, there's Holy Tuesday, there is Holy or Spy Wednesday, there's Holy or Maundy Thursday, there's Good Friday tonight, and then, of course, I've already said it, there's Holy Saturday. Let me share with you a little bit about what these days mean and what they kind of represent. It's talking about Holy Monday, that day following Palm Sunday, is the day that, because, oh, let, let me back up. There are occurrences between the time of Palm Sunday and the crucifixion of Christ. There's things that he still did, being in Bethany and coming into Jerusalem daily and and going to the temple and doing different things. So there's in your Bibles, in our Bibles, there's an account of what Jesus actually did. And so I'm going to highlight some of those things for us so that we don't forget. The title of tonight's message is, Do This in Remembrance of Me. That, that's what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room at that last supper, we call it, right? That Passover meal. It was the time of Passover, in case you didn't know. And, and so Jesus said and gave a command to his disciples as he broke the bread and took the cup. And he says, do this and remember to me. So I think it's important that we remember the account of Christ as he walked to the cross because that's what he was doing. He was moving towards and walking to the cross. Holy Monday is that day that Jesus cleansed the temple. You remember that. He was also praised by the little children. And also, remember, he cursed the fig tree on his way to Jerusalem. It's in Matthew 21. Holy Tuesday, Jesus challenges the religious leaders and their authority. That's in Matthew 21. That's in Mark 11 and Luke 20. Now, Holy Wednesday, it's also known as Spy Wednesday, which is an interesting thing. Jesus was anointed with a spike nard or that oil upon his uh, head during a meal. Now, it's interesting, this Spy Wednesday is called that because it's thought that that was the night that Judas went out and um, made the deal with the religious leaders, he being that spy to betray Jesus. That's in Matthew 26. Holy Thursday is also called Maundy Thursday. M-A-U-N-D-Y. Now that day is given as the day Jesus celebrated that last supper, the, that Passover meal with his disciples. The word Monday comes from the Latin word command. Okay? 
So it's a command. Jesus gave a command to his disciples to do something, to remember him, but also how they should love and serve one another because in that upper room, what did he do? He washed the feet of his disciples, giving them the amazing ultimate example of a true servant. Then there is Holy Saturday. That's the day we know Jesus is in that borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He's in that borrowed tomb, and he's, in a sense, resting from the work of salvation, is he not? He's resting from that work of salvation. His body laying in that tomb. All four Gospels give this same account. That Saturday, I would say, is a day I think that we're to think about. That's tomorrow for us. A day that we should really think about our Lord resting in that tomb because it's a day to think about a world uh, that would be dark if it not were for the hope of Jesus Christ. We would live in a very dark world, guys, if not for the hope of Christ and his resurrection. Then, of course, we've got what? Good Friday, which is tonight. And then we've got Resurrection Sunday, or as the, everyone else calls it too, Easter Sunday. Not the bunny thing, but the, the, the Jesus thing, right? Good Friday is a day that Christians around the world, around the world, remember the death of Jesus and mostly centered on those messages, especially on Good Friday this evening, are messages that are centered and detailed more so on those horrific circumstances of Jesus on the cross. We've taught that here before as we've gone through the Gospels and and other times as well. But another event I think is really, really important. I'd have to say another event to me is, 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 is equally important in a sense, not most, but equally important, and that is that time of the Last Supper. The Lord has really put upon my heart for this time, this season of a time of remembrance. And Jesus gave his disciples that command to remember something. This is the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. The very last one, the final meal he had before the betrayal of Judas and his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible tells us in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke of this specific event. But I want to tell you that it was way more than just a last meal. It it was way more than just a final meal that he's having with his disciples. But it was a meal that celebrated the Passover. And And I'll tell you just a little bit about that in a minute. But that was the night the Passover meal that he would celebrate with his disciples. And at this Passover meal, Jesus does something pretty amazing, I think. He charges his disciples to remember what he was about to do on their behalf. And that's why I think it's very important that we also remember what Christ has done on our behalf. Going to the cross, everything that he had endured Jesus, ultimately, what's going to happen? He's going to be nailed on a cross. His blood is, his blood is going to be shed. He's going to take, take on, and he's going to pay for the debt of our sins for all eternity. That's what he's going to do. That's that act, that sacrificial act of love that Christ did on the cross for you and for me. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, As he took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. For you. Not to you. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Just take a moment, look at that. The words of our Lord. I think what we can see by looking at that verse, that Jesus is giving his disciples a command. It's not like, hey, guys, if you want to, or if you feel like it, or if you think about it. 
But he, he gives them a command, and then he later on will also give them a command in that command saying that whenever you do these things, whenever you do this, remember me. So he emphasizes it even a, a little bit more. Now, the remembering of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we do this every service, right? Every service, we have in the back a little bit of communion. That's what we call it, right? Communion. And in this time of communion, we give that invitation for folks who are sitting out here to go back at their own uh, leading by the Spirit to partake of communion any time during the service, during the worship time. We also have once a month corporate uh, communion, do we not? We have corporate communion to where the body together celebrates, but more remembers what our Lord did for us. To receive, I think, from the Lord's table, there is nothing better that we can receive than from his table. Amen? I mean, absolutely nothing. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, from the Father of lights. So anything on the Lord's table is amazing to receive. And I think that's, that's something that we uh, need to remember. And Paul instructed, in fact, the church in Corinth because they were taking the Lord's Supper in a, in a very wrong way. In fact, they were abusing the Lord's Supper, his, this time of communion. I've got it on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. This is Paul speaking. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is again for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death Until he comes. For as often as you do this. For as often as you do this. He says. Remember me. Until the time I return again. So the command by Jesus. Is to continue doing this. Whenever we can do this. You don't have to do it just at church. You can do it at home. You can do it anywhere. Celebrate the Lord's Supper. So he says, as often as you drink of this, as often as you eat of this, just remember me. I mean, isn't that why many times we've maybe fallen into the, into the tradition? I think sometimes it's a tradition of praying before a meal. The words come out kind of rote. But we're to thank God for this food. And we're to remember that God sent his son Jesus in the sense of the breaking of the bread. And the drinking of the juice was something that, man, that we're to remember his his sacrifice for us. So even a time before we pray before the meal time, that was a meal, a Passover meal. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Communion is for believers. Believers are the ones that understand and, and appreciate and can have gratitude of their hearts when they receive that from the Lord's table so to be observed with a heart of humility coming to the Lord's table Paul instructs the church as I said because they were abusing this amazing gift of God and when we receive communion as we will this evening at the end of the service when we receive communion we're not to put Jesus back up on the cross We're not to, I think, um, um, re-sacrifice Jesus. He's already made the sacrifice, right? He's already done it. He didn't say reenact this. He didn't say uh, re-sacrifice me. He just said, remember what I've done. That's all he said. But as we receive that bread and that cup, we have been asked to remember Jesus. And then he says, and proclaim my death until I come. That's what Paul said. Proclaim his death until he comes. 
So he's given us that command to share his death, to share his resurrection, to share him. Jesus is alive today, guys, right? Jesus is alive today. And, and, and each time we receive, we're taking part in the Lord's table. We're remembering he's alive and he's coming back. That's what we remember. He is alive. How is he alive? He's alive in every one of you here this evening. If you're a believer tonight, you've brought him into this building. The spirit of God is in you. You've accepted him into your life. That's an amazing thing. And I find that for me, that is just so comforting this building is so empty without you all here. It is. Yeah, there's remnants of the things of the Lord I can see when I'm here alone, walking through and seeing the chairs or walking through the children's area, but I hear those, those things. You know, I don't think you think I'm weird, but I hear those things because I see those things. Sundays to Wednesdays, Wednesdays to Sundays, special events and whatnot. I just see those things. But it's not the same without you all being here because you bring that joy and you bring that love and you bring that amazing, that, that, that you bring Jesus with you. And to me, that, there's nothing better than that. So, so why, why have a remembrance, right? Why, why would Jesus want us to? Well, understand that the most dramatic truth I think that God wants us to remember is that his son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for our sins. He wants us to know that. That's why he wants us to remember it. He also wants us to know that we can come to Christ for forgiveness. And we can come to Christ for grace. Don't we need that in this world? Grace. Grace. Just turn on the news for 10 minutes. There ain't no grace. There ain't no mercy. But we come to Christ because of forgiveness and because of grace. He wants us to remember that Jesus Christ is the once for all sacrifice. The once and for all sacrifice. Nothing else and no one else can ever, ever do that except for Jesus how should we remember him then? I mean, what is, is there a right way or a wrong way? Well, a quick answer is no. In the sense of come to him with a humility of heart. Come to him with that gratitude and that appreciation of what he's done for us. There isn't any specific thing that we need to do. The Bible doesn't tell us, in fact, how to receive from the Lord's table. But 1 Corinthians does remind us how, in the sense of our hearts. The bread here, and you guys have a, will be able to partake. The bread here, one that shows us his body that is crucified, broken for our sin. It's, it's pierced. I have a little cracker that's pierced, and I have one that's kind of scarred with the heat, but it's reminiscent, and it reminds us of Jesus' body. And, and then the cup that we have that's filled with a, a reddish-colored juice is one of which reflects and reminds us of the blood of Christ that was shed for us for a remission or a taking away of our sin. That, that's what it does. The red equates the blood. And that, that, that whole idea of, of the bread and, and the blood or the bread and the juice, it totally reminds us, which is communion, communing with God, pictures for us what, what happened on the cross what it means, and, and, and how it's to impact our lives. I think if the cross doesn't impact our lives, we've got to check for our pulse. It should impact us greatly for what he did on the cross. How often are we supposed to remember this? Well, it seems that we remember the Lord's sacrifice often, as many times as we can, in fact. And like I said, man, do it at home. You know, do it at home, do it at a restaurant, 
Don't worry about what other people think or say. Celebrate the Lord. He's commanded us to do that. We've been given no rules and no methods on how to remember or how to receive. The purpose of, 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 of communion, of Jesus saying, do this in remembrance, is to remember him, to focus on him. That's the idea, is to focus on Jesus without this becoming a routine in our lives. We're to remember and I think receive from the Lord's table with reverence and with love and with a sense of amazing, great appreciation and gratitude for Jesus and what he's done. Now, Jesus had said this in Luke twenty-two fifteen. He said this to them, I f- fervently desire to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus here not only is predicting his, his own suffering and death on the cross, but he's also used the Last Supper, this Passover, to give it a whole new meaning, guys. A whole new meaning. I want you to understand about this thing. He's he's ushering in a whole new covenant and he's giving a whole new decree to the disciples just by what he said in Luke 22, 15. In the observing of the the Passover, he's giving us this, this, this different way of looking at it. And the apostles, a different way to look at it in the sense of the fulfillment of, of Jesus, of the Passover. He is, in fact, the Passover lamb. He is, in fact, the Passover. Passover was remembered annually by all of those in Israel. It was, it was to be a, a time of remembrance for the exodus coming out of Israel. And if you recall, of the ten plagues upon Pharaoh in Egypt, that final plague was one of which they were instructed to put blood over the doorposts of their, of their dwellings, right? Amongst a few other things. But the blood over the doorpost, reminiscent of the, the wood and the blood on a cross, on the cross, allowed the angel of death to pass over and not kill the firstborn within that home. And we know how it ended up, right, with those Egyptians and those who did not apparently do that. So the idea of Passover and the celebration of Passover was to remind the Jewish people that God saved them. God saved them. And most importantly, he saved them from death. So see, do you get the Passover, that that Jesus is the Passover? Do you get the fact that he is that Passover lamb, that Passover sacrifice? Because he has saved us and he has saved us from death death and so jesus takes that that passover and he makes it all new for the disciples now and for us to see that he is truly the passover lamb and at that last supper man the he and the apostles took the elements that were symbolic of the elements even of passover itself and gave them a whole new way to remember his sacrifice and and remember him always To remember that a sacrifice saved us from spiritual death and saved us from spiritual bondage. That's what his sacrifice has accomplished. Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 19, that he took bread, gave thanks, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Again, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Jesus then also encourages those gathered at the last meal that what they believe is true. That who they followed is the real deal. And then they're remembering every single time they receive the elements of communion that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Does anybody here have any doubt that Jesus Christ is their Savior? I pray not. 
Because at the Last Supper, when he took that unleavened bread and he took that cup and he told them again who he was and what he was going to do for them, he said, I think, paraphrase three things. It's up on the screen for you. He said, number one, he says, I am your daily provision. You guys know that. Jesus is our daily provision. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. He said, if you belong to me, you will be in eternity with me. John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone casts this, uh, eats of this bread, he will live forever. A bread that I will give for life of the world is my flesh. Thirdly, he said, commit your life to me and be with me in eternity. John 6, 54, the one who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day, speaking of a resurrected, bodily resurrection, because my flesh is true food and my body is true drink. Now, as this is received... Remembrance, remembrance and, and humility of heart. That's how we're to receive this. I think also we're supposed to remember how we walk. How our walk is as Christians. Because Jesus is going to show us a way to walk and how he walked. Because he walked this way. Jesus left the disciples with, I think, a basis or a foundation of servanthood and forgiveness. Both things, two things, servanthood and forgiveness. And he did this how, guys? By washing the feet of his disciples. I don't know if you guys have ever had that done for you before. I have. It's really weird, I will tell you. All right, a little uncomfortable. All right. But amazingly, like, makes you so humble. It, it, yeah, it's weird, but it's like humbling. All right? It's, it's no problem for us probably to do that for someone else, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of a little bit easier. But to have someone wash your feet? Who? I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's difficult. But Jesus showed us as far as he was concerned, it wasn't weird. <laughs> it wasn't difficult. It says that he just, he just girded himself to pull the basin out and started washing them. Because he loved them. And he wanted to show them an amazing picture of servanthood. And, and don't worry, I'm not going to have a foot washing thing tonight, Okay. <laughs> A lot of churches do that, all right? But I won't, I won't do that here. Maybe next year, but I won't do that here tonight. I'll give fair warning. Go get your mani petties going and then, you know, then we'll do that. He takes the concept of servanthood and he turns it like psh, upside down, guys. Jesus does. He takes that concept and, and, and he says, man, you know what? If, if whoever's greatest is going to be the least. And, and he even says that if, if you are, are like the guest of honor and you sit at the head of the table, hey, hey, be a servant nonetheless. Still be a servant. Serve others. The death of Christ, man, it, it is typified, I think, Man, at the Last Supper. It's remembered at that Last Supper in that he, as I've said, was the Passover. He was the Passover. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be new unleavened bread or a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Amen? He has been sacrificed. Normally, the Passover is done with family. Jesus was with his family that night. 
You know, my family's in California. My mom and dad are there. My wife's, Jean's family's there in California. My sons and his family are out here. But, but my family's in California. And so I get to celebrate this with you all, right? Because you're my family. You are. And, and I find that my family in Christ is pretty amazing. And I think Jesus found the same thing with his family, the disciples, his followers. It was normally a family time to celebrate that Passover, but at the Last Supper, it was Jesus and his disciples. I think with the apostles there, it causes us a little bit to remember that the disciples or the apostles, man, he's giving a charge also to the church. The, the apostles, I believe, are, are also reminiscent or a picture of the, those foundation stones of the church as they went out and planted churches and people got saved. So he's not only speaking to them as, as, as family or as, as fellow Jews, but he's speaking to them as, as foundation stones of the church because they're going to go out, and he knows it. He knows the minute that he ascends that they're going to be, that's it, they've got their marching orders, they're headed out. And so it's a pretty amazing, this whole thing that I see, and just even in the picture of the apostles themselves. The Last Supper has its roots in the old promises. And, 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 and the Last Supper also is, is then declared in the new promises that we have in the New Testament. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is an old promise that came to fruition. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. Did not Jesus say that there will be a new covenant in his blood? A new covenant. Something new. This was actually a new promise between God and between Israel. God said, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33. When Jesus said that the cup, this cup is a new covenant of my blood, he's making a direct reference, I think, to that promise. A new dispensation. Dispensation just means a time. A, a new time was before the apostles. And it was called an amazing thing, which, which I love, uh, that was turning into now God's redemption. This new time of redemption, this new time of grace that God is giving us. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said, right? That's what he said. Every time you and I receive communion then is our time to remember that Jesus is revealed in the, in the elements. He is not contained in the elements, but he's revealed in the elements. They're symbols, okay, for us to remember the bread and the cup. His passion, man, I think a passion week, and his passion was for us. It was for us. That's where his passion lied. And finally, I just want to leave us with three things to remember before we partake in communion. Number one, we're to remember Jesus, his passion for us, and then have a passionate worship for him. That's what we're to do. Remember how passionate he is for you. And then we're to reflect that same passionate worship back to him. We're to remember his suffering for us and that we should be willing to also suffer for his cause. Okay? The worship part is easy, but also in worship, in, in the suffering, suffering is also worshipful to the Lord. Thirdly, we're to remember to proclaim his message of life. Proclaim his message of life from death and eternal salvation and, and having that eternal salvation. So we're to remember those things, guys. His passion for us, his suffering for us, and proclaiming his message. That's what we're charged to do. And I think tonight, as we now, the team's gonna come on up and we take an opportunity for communion. 
I guess the word of the night is what? Do this in remembrance of me, right? That's the phrase for this evening. And so as we just turn the lights off there in the back, you know, just take a time. The, the guys are going to go ahead and hand it out. They can come on up and, and they're going to hand it out to you. And if you just want to sit here as, as, as the team then sings um, this one song, um, and then we'll partake right after. So let's just pray. Lord, um, tonight, God, we just thank you. I thank you, Lord for everything that you've done and and Lord by going to the cross Lord it just sounds uh, I pray just not repetitious but but God you've done so much for us and Lord that should compel us to tell others of how much you've done for us Lord and so tonight Lord before we partake of communion Lord I pray that we would come to this table in humility of heart and reverence of our mind, Lord. And God, that if there is anything that we need to ask of you in forgiveness, we can come to you, Lord, for forgiveness and grace. So, Lord, let us not be afraid. If someone doesn't know you here tonight, Lord, God, if they don't have a relationship with you, Lord, before they partake, God, may they ask you into their heart. May they ask you to be the Lord and Savior of their life. May they want you, Lord, to be in every part and facet of who they are and what they do. God, may they just ask you into their hearts, Lord, right now. And you will, as we're told, bring them revelation, illuminate their minds to the things of God. Forgiveness and grace. That is what is between the arms of your son Jesus as he hung up on the cross. And it is so wide. It is so deep. That God, no matter what we've done or what we're going to do, Lord, There is forgiveness and grace at the cross. Lord, you instructed your disciples so many years ago at the Passover meal that you indeed were the Passover and you instructed them, God, to to remember that time, to remember what they were doing. So, Lord, tonight, on this Good Friday, Let us also remember you, Lord. Up on the cross at Calvary, arms open, a crown of thorns, pierced for our transgression, and by your stripes, Lord, we are healed. There is forgiveness for anyone who seeks it and wants it. So Lord, for any of us, Lord, as we've walked with you, God, we ask for forgiveness, God. I know I do. For things, Lord, that I might have said or done or things that I know that are just not edifying or not representative of who you desire me to be. So God, I, 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 I ask for your forgiveness tonight, Lord. And I rest upon your grace. Thank you, Lord, 
for your grace. Thank you for loving us so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys hand out the elements and the gals hand out elements. Um, Just sit with the Lord, okay? As they sing, just sit with the Lord. It's a time just to remember Jesus. us when the hour had come he sat down and the twelve apostles with him then he said to them with fervent desire I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffered for I say to you I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said take this Divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 
Then it tells us that he took the bread, he broke it. And so we, at this time, if you have that little cracker in your hand, he says, if you take this bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Then it says, likewise, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's partake of the juice. Heavenly Father, We love you so much, God. And we thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus to us, Lord. He being that amazing ultimate missionary coming to this place and showing us who the Father truly is. And Lord, all these millennia later, We have your written word that reveals your heart to us, Lord. And it's all revealed through the revealing of your son, Jesus. And so, God, we we thank you for that. And, Lord, tonight as we partook of the bread and the juice, Lord, that representation and picture of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you. You tell us in your word, God, that in the blood, that's where life is. It's in the blood. All of life is contained, Lord, within the blood. And only those, God, I know who receive of the body, the bread, the blood, the juice of Christ, Lord, can understand that. So, Lord, tonight, man, God, thank you so much for what your son did in the upper room. Thank you, God, that all of the fulfillment of Scripture is done through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, this evening, I'm just going to take just a little time, God, just to have a little bit more reflection on you, Lord. Just a little bit more time, Lord, that we can just remember you tonight. That our hearts and our minds are fully focused on you, Lord, your son, Jesus.
lift your arms up? Do you want to kneel? Just want to give thanks to God. I mean, He's worthy. He's worthy to give thanks. Father, we, man, we give you all the glory, Lord. We give you all the praise tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, again. And we're going to keep saying it. We just thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus. We, we thank you, God, for the plan of salvation. We thank you, God, for strengthening your son in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Lord, that he by obedience, Lord, went to the cross for us. And that Lord, that he understood the pressure and the pain that was involved, that he sweat drops of blood. God, it had to be done. It had to be done. We thank you for the obedience of your son Jesus for us. So Lord, tonight we, we do say it's a good Friday. And we rejoice, God, for the resurrection Sunday. And Lord, tomorrow let us just kind of think and dwell upon the time that your son rested in that tomb awaiting to be resurrected by that resurrection power of you, Lord, as you raised him from the dead. And what this world would be like without Jesus. What this world would be like without your Holy Spirit. It would be dark. And so, God, tonight, we thank you. I thank you for our family here at the church, Lord thank you, God, that you give us opportunity to praise you, to sing to you, to pray to you, Lord, to read your word, to love on one another. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we all agree by saying amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord an offering of praise tonight.